Some people have a lot of problems in life, have a lot of discouragements. You begin to ask them what they're discouraged about, why well, it's pretty difficult to find. It's, they just say, here's usually the thing, well, the devil's been on my case. Well, what do you mean the devil's been on your case? What's the devil doing? <clears throat> well, I don't like to talk about that either, but nonetheless... What is really behind all this stuff going on tonight? I want to speak to you about formula number six. And this we're going to be dealing with the subject of overcoming depression. Confessing our way out of depression. Now, <clears throat> most people have never experienced a whole lot of problem uh, that could not be handled if they knew how to handle it. <clears throat> Here, beginning at verse 21 in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, uh, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I'd been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings off, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides these things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I'm not weak. Who is offended, and I burn not. If I need glory, I will glory in the things concerning my infirmities. The God of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Artius the king kept the city of the Nazarenes with a garrison desired to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Lord, do open our understanding tonight because this is a very important moment. For the people here, because somebody may learn something tonight about you or what could get them free that they're not familiar with as of now. Thank you, Lord, for deliverance and victory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Here's a man that said, I've been through a lot of things. This is the same man that said, I am exceeding joyful in all my tribulations. This, the secret to this man's success is found in the verse that I just read in verse 30. If I'm in a sneeze glory, he's not going to glory in his problems. He's glory, going to glory in the things concerning his infirmity because, he said, God the Father who is blessed forevermore knows I'm lying. I'm not lying. No, I'm not. He said, I have come through all this, but the emphasis wasn't placed on the infirmities. The emphasis was placed on coming through the problems. <clears throat> you see, what happens to people all times if they begin to sin, when they sin, whether it's small or great, 
Here's the thing I want you to get. If you forget everything else that I said tonight, you get this. This is what the Lord showed me today, which is new to me, and it may be new to you. Satan will try to tempt you and test you and tempt you and test you and tempt you. And if you yield to that temptation, uh, now he begins to accuse you. He points his finger of accusation against you. That's where your guilt and the condemnation comes from. That's now, if he cannot make you feel bad enough, then he tries to get other people to help to accuse you. Because he cannot rightfully accuse you until after he has gotten you to slip or fall. That's probably the reason a lot of people, when they go into depression, are not aware of the fact that they need to recover from whatever caused them. But what happens when you sin? If you feel like you blew it, you just turn right around and go out and do something worse or keep on doing it. What happens when people sin? They quit going to church. A lady wrote to me one time and wanted to know if I had any kind of message on how to deal with oppression. Depression, I said, yes, I do. I sent it to her and I said, the thing's pretty rough, but you need to get the point. Well, she didn't get the point. She got the offense. She wasn't interested in anything like that. She was hoping that I had a message that would tell her how to live successfully in her pity party stuff. Nobody is going to live in victory in pity party situations. Nobody can. If a person can get caught to do something in violation of God's Word and get their center, center their thinking around themselves, here's the first thing that's going to happen. You lose your reasoning power. See, when you are in depression or you start to worry about something, you lose your capacity to reason, to, to think. In fact, your thinking capacity goes on a strike because your thinking capacity is not in operation and functioning correctly. What happens, you start making blunders, and the more you blunder, the more the accuser comes on your scene. When you center your thinking around yourself, you automatically become a problem because you're a problem of yourself. When, when a person violates God's laws, getting, his, getting their mind off of God, getting it on their problems, it's not really their problems they're getting their situation on, it's getting it on themselves. They become the center of attention. They expect to manipulate God with their decisions, whatever happens to them. So they lose expectation because once the accusing finger of Satan and all the others that are helping him begins to be pointed at you, uh, you begin to, to defend yourself and you get into more problems. So really what we need to do is come up and begin to understand how to get out of this problem. Uh, perhaps the greatest <clears throat> problem area is in living the past. So day one, whatever day you start, we start with day one, you begin to confess, I refuse to think, ponder, or meditate on my bad past. There are several things about dealing on a bad past. Either what you did to yourself or what somebody else did to you because it's, the past is past. Therefore, it's not wise to go back and meditate on the past. It's, it's to press forward, to go on ahead. You may have to correct some things in your past, but only to correct them. To, uh, you may have to go and confess something you did wrong, or you may have to repent, or... You may have to, uh, <clears throat> you may have the sin of commission or the sin of omission operating in your life. 
procrastination or whatever, and there you have to deal with that matter. But the idea of it is, is to get past your past. Paul rehearsed all this information to us of what all happened. If you look through this, people were involved, and he could actually say that God was involved. Because he's been on the sea and it's a storm out there and snakes bite him and the wilderness and, and what have you said in perils and perils and perils. What happened to Paul was he never blamed anybody for his problems. He said at one place, he said, if I'm going to glory, I'm going to glory in Jesus. See, when that, when that thing is broken off, he said, all this happened to me plus the cares of the church and everything else. In fact, he even put me down in the basket one time. <clears throat> but the ring is victory. He's not talking oppression. He said in Philippians 3, which is our Bible verse for this particular one, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press, I press toward the mark. Now, I want to say to you tonight that when Paul made a decision that, yes, I was wrong. In fact, here's what he says. Uh, this is not a part of your uh, uh, memory, but I give it to you as a reinforcement verse. He said, he was talking about himself, and he said about the grace of God and the blessing of God coming upon him. He said, who was before a blasphemer? and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorance and in unbelief. And the grace of God was exceeding, abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Now, if you think about this, Paul said, yes, yes, it is true that I was a blasphemer. It is true that I was a persecutor. It is true that I was injurious. It is true that I had a terrible bad past. But Paul refused to meditate, ponder on that past. He said, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting that thing which is behind, I'm pressing forward. Now, when you get that in your spirit, <clears throat> that yes, Somebody did hurt me. Yes, somebody did cause me a lot of pain. My mother did reject me. My dad rejected me, or this or that, or any other excuse. Yet you say, I'm forgetting that my future is ahead of me. There was a man dying <clears throat> because the doctor said he's dying. It made him discouraged. It made him very perplexed. <clears throat> he, he became very discouraged. In fact, he got mean. His own testimony was that he, he got mean with his wife and family because he's suffering a lot. And he lays there dying, and it's making him upset. He's about cheated in life. Life cheated him. And he begins to think of all this bad stuff that's happening to him. And after he had laid there for several months in that agony, <clears throat> didn't know when he's going to die, didn't have any hope of ever getting better, he said, you know, I'm wondering why I'm acting like this. If I'm going to die, why don't I make the best out of it while I'm living? He said, you know, it's just stupid for me to lay here groaning and moaning and blaming everybody else. And he made a decision. He said, I'm going to come out of this thing. I don't know whether I'll die or when I'll die, but I'm not going to die this way. And he got up. <clears throat> and he said, you know, I'll probably die any time, but I'm going to have fun doing it. I'm not going to sit around pitying myself. You know, the fellow decided, I think I'm going to take a trip. 
And the doctor said, oh, no, you ain't taking a trip either. <clears throat> he went anyway. Said he got out there and got to thinking, you know, this is pretty good. I'm feeling better. You know, the man never did die. Not as far as I know, he's still alive. <laughs> Perfectly healed. Got his mind off himself. <clears throat> you see, when you get your mind off of yourself you, and you stop getting de depressed, you have, listen to me, you have the capability of arresting depression. You have in you the capability of doing that. But you're first of all going to have to get out from under the, the fact that you, if you're going to meditate upon depression, you can't reason. If you start thinking about some other things besides your problems. See, I could have a nervous breakdown tonight if I wanted to. Start thinking about all my problems. You people don't have any idea what problems I'm facing. You don't have any idea. <clears throat> you don't see me all broke up. God in heaven will have to take care of me. I mean, to try to get this ministry lines the way we need to do it is beyond my help. I'm not going to sit around and meditate on it. <clears throat> I'm not going to sit down and start pitying myself. <clears throat> See, if you don't watch it, you can help the devil. Depression cuts reasoning off. You can't even reason anymore. For the most part, a lot of our problems would never happen anyway. If you listen to what the world says, did you know that it's a fact now that every tenth person is going to have a mental breakdown sometime in their life? You don't have to be the tenth person, do you? <laughs> I'm not about to take that place. And so, if I want to come away from depression, I will stop thinking, meditating, and pondering over the bad past. Whether it's what I did or somebody else did. There's people that today will say, Oh, if only I wouldn't have done that. Oh, if only. Come on, folks. You can't change the past, but you can change the future. Day two. <clears throat> I refuse to blame my upbringing and my present circumstances or anyone or anything for making me depressed. See, people say, well, the reason I'm depressed is because of the place I work. It's just depressing. To work around so-and-so is really difficult. <clears throat> it's the words that I hear that makes me depressed. It's uh, somebody lied about me. That's what makes me depressed. Somebody caused me a lot of pain. That's the reason I'm depressed. No, the reason you're depressed is because you have not found the answer because your mind is cluttered up. Now listen, Isaiah 54 and verse 14 says, In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror it shall not come nigh thee or near thee. Now I want to ask you tonight, is that a commandment? What is that? That's God saying, this is not going to happen to you. In righteousness thou shalt be established. All right, right back to the accusing finger of the devil. I'm not righteous. Well, he said in, in the first formula we had, that he said in that verse, he said, uh, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And then what? And their righteousness is of me. So if you're waiting until you get perfect in every way, you start now. Nobody has ever planted a field of corn, but what they had to wait for a while. <clears throat> See, when we start blaming 
somebody else for our troubles or we start saying, well, I wasn't brought up right. Have you ever heard people crying and saying, my mom and dad treated me so bad I got a spanking when I was three years old? And I mean, it's just a terrible lamenting time. Well, you know, my mama gave me a spanking one time. Oh, she hit me hard. And, you know, isn't that something? I mean, oh, we can just cry about all these things. If only <clears throat> they'd have treated me different. If only I wouldn't have been born in such a poor setting. And the reason I'm poor today is because my mom and dad was poor. And so I'm poor and I can't do anything about it. The reason I got a temper is because my daddy had a temper. <clears throat> and oh, man, you know, all this kind of stuff gets us down. We lose the capacity to reason. So we say, it was my upbringing, or it's a circumstance. Pastor Rhodes has said some mean things in the service, and now I've got a nervous breakdown coming up. See, once you start that, the accusing finger of Satan begins to accuse you, and he rightfully can do it because you're guilty. You know, when the Lord showed me that, I said, oh, my. I never realized that. He said, that's where condemnation and guilt comes from. It's Satan condemning you. If you learn to judge yourself, you would not be judged. Accusing finger. You know, to me, that makes all the difference in the world. If I'm under guilt and condemnation, I say, now wait a little, wait a little. I did goof up, didn't I? All right, Satan, I'll tell you, I was a, but I'm not anymore. <clears throat> Have you ever gotten nervous? Somebody talks to you about a certain thing in your life. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Those are the words from the book of wisdom known as the Bible. It's a glorious expression. I am what I think. If I think my mom and dad didn't bring me up right, why, well, you know what? There's 15 of us in the family, and I could sit around and say, you know, I think that the children, the little ones got more attention than I did. <laughs> I didn't have time to think of that junk. And I could really have a nervous breakdown tonight because my mama made me eat peas when I didn't like them. She forced me to eat peas. <clears throat> Well, a lot of our nonsense. See, once you blame somebody else, that's all you need to do. Get it, get it. I told you, if you don't get anything else, get this. All you need to do is blame somebody else for your problems, and the accusing finger of the accuser comes into operation, and you've got a problem. And what are you going to do with it? If you're like some people, you just keep blaming. <clears throat> so it probably gets worse. Then you need a counselor. And he'll tell you, oh, you've been molested when he's three years old. I don't know what's three. I guess that's the hook they got. You know, folks, I tell you, I believe if people listen to what I tell you, I believe you can get set free. I'm free. Has anybody ever accused me? Oh, my. You could write a book on all my accusers. And you know what I'd like to do with all my accusers? i just love to pray for them. Or somebody just recently, I mean some nasty character, just up and I mean really tried to plaster me with all they could. And you know... It was, a, it was really a coming against me. I mean, it wasn't nothing kind at all. You know, I wanted to tell him off. I mean, I really did. And I said, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. 
I didn't realize then that the accusing finger of the devil would start pointing at me. I didn't know it then. I know it now. I said, Lord, would you do me a favor? Would you give him the best blessing you got or something like this? Would you bless him? Would you just really bless him? You know, all of a sudden, it didn't make any difference what the man said. You know what it did? It loosed it. It loosed it off of me. Casting down the bands of wickedness. That's what it's doing. And now, tonight, when you get these Bible verses and begin to say, In righteousness I shall be established. That's it. I am going to be righteous. I'm not going to let the devil point his finger at me. And don't get, don't get one of those ideas that, you know, nobody's righteous and all this kind of stuff. Use some reasoning here. If you've made a mistake, there is a cross that was up there on the hill years ago, and there is something done about that mistake. Get rid of it. Put everything in the past. The number one point was getting the bad past in the past. Getting the present bad stuff in the past. Getting everything that happened to you in the past. We're heading for the future, folks. It is past-minded people that find most trouble with their problems. Day three. Now, all right, there's a lot of problems. They're just always coming. What am I going to do with them? Day three, I refuse to be depressed, but will cast all my care upon the Lord. Folks, this is one of the greatest and most wonderful experiences that you can experience. First Peter 5, 7, just before he talks about the devil coming as a roaring lion, he said these words, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He's caring about you. I don't have to have that burden. I can cast it on the Lord. In fact, for a reinforcement, here in Psalms 55, 22, that's easy to remember, 55, 22, it says, cast thy burden upon the Lord. The word there, Lord, is Jehovah, the head one, the great one, the mighty one. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. God's got a defense around you, and the power is so strong that nothing can cause you to carry that burden. The Lord is saying to many people, give me that burden. No, I want it. <clears throat> Isn't it strange how many people suffer needlessly because they want attention? There's better ways of having joy than having somebody come up to you and say, I feel so sorry for you. <laughs> you know, weeping on each other's shoulders and stuff. My friends, that's not life. That's, that's not life at all. That's the wrong thing. It's no wonder the accusing finger of the devil is pointed at people. Cast the burden upon the Lord. Lord, I can't take care of this debt situation. I don't know what to do about it. You do. Here it is. You take it. You try to go to bed. And about that time, debt. <laughs> I would paid bills. They're on the Lord. I've cast them on the Lord. Has the Lord ever paid your bills before? Not yet, but he's going to pay these. <laughs> How's the Lord going to pay them? Because he said the cattle on a thousand hills is his, the gold and silver is his. I don't know where you go get it. Something else maybe you hadn't thought about. The wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. <laughs> so maybe one of you old city boys is going to get it. <laughs> Have to pay me out of debt. Maybe one of your rock singers. Somebody calls that day. Somebody got some money one time from Hobo. And they blamed him for having defiled money. All of it's defiled. The Bible calls it filthy lucre. 
whether the money comes from horse racing or gambling, I care less. Let's get the gospel out. How, how do you, did you ever check your pocketbook and say, Now, Lord, and the money that I'm carrying here, has any of it been used by a harlot? Has any of it been used in selling dope? Has any of it been used, Lord, to sell liquor or anything? And say, yes, it's all been defiled. Now what are you going to do with it? Yeah, I'll tell you what, folks. Day five. Day five. Well, day four. Day four. I refuse to worry or become depressed about my future needs. What's going to happen? How am I going to feed this family? How am I going to raise this family? How am I going to have a job to pay for all this? Many other questions that come into mind. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory of Christ Jesus. Let's get a new look at that verse. Let's not use this verse in a mechanical form as we have in the past. Let's use it now correctly. My God will take care of me. How do I know? Because as a second witness and as a confirming verse, Matthew 6, 26 says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Much better. We're much better than those sparrows, and he take care of them. Uh, and the fowls of the air. <clears throat> Some of those fowls are not all that great a deal, but they're getting fed. They know exactly what to do. God has taken care of them. You say, well, what are we going to wear? What are we going to eat? Wherewith all shall we be clothed? And he said, you let me take care of that worry problem. You quit worrying about it. You let me worry about it. Can you imagine worrying about something that God's not worried about? Somebody said, God is never late. I said, well, sometimes I thought he was. Now, we're going to come into a, the fifth day. I refuse to associate myself with those who gossip, slander, and talk about others. Why? Because that's going to cause me depression. So I've got to cut that relationship off. No more being a part of the slandering group. Because the Bible says the words of a talebearer are his wounds. And they go down to the innermost parts of the belly. If I talk against you, I'm going to hurt you and me both. Therefore, I need to understand that. You see, that's the reason Psalms 1 says, in verse, starting at verse 1, Blessed are, blessed are, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth, in the seat of the scornful. Right there is where many people fail, sitting in the seat of the scornful. When you sit in the seat of the scornful, <clears throat> Satan can accuse you of being in the wrong place. It's equivalent to being in the tavern. When you sit where people are slandering and gossiping and talking against each other, the accusing finger of the devil is going to hit you, and rightfully so. You ought to hurt when you have that. But Jesus came to deliver us out of that mess. <clears throat> Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly and does all these things. But he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water, and whatsoever he does will prosper. We're going to reverse this thing instead of a Instead of gossiping and slandering and tail-bearing crowd, we start hanging around people that's got something good to say, something wonderful, something blessed, something precious. Words of encouragement. You can do it. 
You don't have to have this depression on you. I'm saying tonight, you don't have to be depressed. Most people have not any earthly idea why they're depressed anyway. They say the devil's been doing it. Well, <clears throat> listen, who's the master of your life, the devil or God or Jesus? It depends who you're letting be the master. If, if you will start to get a, a revelation of this fact that, listen, if I'm down in discouragement and perplexity and blaming the devil for it, that I'm telling the devil he's got more power than God's got through the precious blood of Jesus. See, gossiping, slandering, and tailbearing makes you feel worthless. It'll drag you down. It makes you feel ungodly. It makes you feel like you're your failure. When you start tearing down others, you tear down yourself. But if you will reverse the thing and say, no, I refuse to be a part of that, you can come out of depression, you can come out of it in flying colors. Many people need to hear this. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. <clears throat> Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, <coughs> but rather let it be healed. Hebrews 12, <coughs> 12 and 13. Now, isn't that superior to gossiping and slandering? Hang, does, hang the, the, the feeble knees and the hands that hang down. Walk up and say, hey, come on, let's go. We can do it. There's not a person in this building or listening to this cassette tape that cannot do something different than you got. I don't care if you was born in a <clears throat> ditch and thrown in the trash can when you was a little baby, like many of my men. God's got his hand right there ready to help you out of every situation and circumstances you've ever faced. I'm sorry for that circumstances. You may be an old man or an old woman, you say, sitting in a nursing home somewhere, and nobody loves you and nobody cares. Get your eyes off of that mess and get your eyes on Jesus. Did you have anything to eat today? Yes, but I don't have an appetite. You have clothes to wear. I don't know. You got to get over to that stuff. You start getting real. You're, you see, when you're depressed, when you are depressed, you lose your reasoning. When you lose your reasoning, you can be under the power of the accuser. Day six, I refuse to judge or condemn my fellow man for any reason. This has caused a many a heartache and a many a sorrow. Judge not that ye be not judged. Condemn not, you should not be condemned. Forgiven, you shall be forgiven. Given, it shall be given you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give to your bosom. Luke 6, 37, 38. Give. What do you want people to give back to you? <clears throat> if I judge somebody, that judgment will come back on me. <clears throat> if you judge me, I judge you, we have a problem. Then what happens the moment we start judging the condemning finger of the accuser begins to accuse us, and rightfully so. We're guilty. How can you condemn a person that's not guilty? Romans 14, 10. Now why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, 10. I'm asking you this, folks, tonight. <clears throat> Do you realize there's a good, legitimate reason why a lot of people are discouraged? Why they're depressed? Why they have to take depression medicine? And all this kind of stuff. Because... That kind of stuff is a joy killer. It's a hope killer. It's a destructive vehicle. 
You take this formula, and those of you listening to this on cassette tape, you take this formula, and you start listening to this thing, and start practicing what this formula is telling you to do, you will not be any longer clamped and cramped into this thing. I believe the difference between depression and oppression and deliverance is simply in choice. You may have to go back and wonder, now what did happen here? What, what opened the door to this particular thing? Because if, if Jesus Christ is magnified in my life, now listen carefully. If Jesus Christ is magnified in my life, I can praise Him. So I start praising Him, and the accuser has no, no uh, chance. Because I am now refusing to judge my fellow man. <clears throat> you know, one day somebody said something to me, and they accused somebody of something, and I, you know, it sounded so real, and I believed it. I mean, you know, plain believed it. I had no question about it. It went on for some time, and I found out it wasn't even one bit of it true. And I felt so dumb, and I got under depression almost about the situation. Here, I blamed that person, passed that story on. <clears throat> Esther and I remember a time when somebody started a story about an individual, and they lied about him. Somebody lied about him to degrade him, to run him down. And Esther and I heard the story, and we believed it. <clears throat> Everybody else believed it. Here they found out five years later, probably, that all this was a made-up story, and a man came forward and said, I lied about it. This is not true. This Holy Spirit got on him so bad he couldn't stand it. He went around and told people, <clears throat> listen, this, this isn't true. This is all lie. Now, guess what the response was? This is enough to rock your boat. Some people said, I don't care if you said it wasn't right or not. I know it was. That's just the kind of man he is. And you know, that man, as far as I know, went to his grave with enemies. Somebody had started the story. Tonight, folks, it's your privilege and mine to take the axe to the root of the trees and cut that junk out of our lives. Victory don't come with gossip and slander and tail-bearing judging. It comes when we're free, casting all those cares on him for it cares for you, thinking differently, changing your ideas, changing your opinion, changing your thoughts. What a beautiful thing it is. I've told Esther, and she knew this, of course, there was a time that I'm telling you I was a judge. I could judge people, thought I was right, and probably was, <clears throat> but it didn't work because God didn't call me to be a judge. I tell you what, <clears throat> let God do the work. We ought to love each other. Now, of course, there's a certain measure of judgment all of us are going to have to have. If you see a man drunk or walk across the street, you ought to have judgment enough to know not to run over him. The man's not thinking right. <clears throat> but we need to have compassion and mercy on each other. Number seven, <clears throat> I refuse to be anxious about anything. I'm not going to sit around and start worrying about anything. <clears throat> How many things do you, could you sit down and worry about tonight? It's plenty of things you can worry about. If you think about how worthless it is, you know, you worry about such things like this. How am I ever going to get my car paid for? This car is going to soon wear out and then I have to have another. I'm worried about when I go have a home to live in. I'm worried about this and worried about that and worried about this and worried about that. And the more you start worrying, the worse it gets. You get anxious and so forth. Here's what God said, do. 
This is your Bible verse to take and hit this with. And Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. I think the rest of that verse says the Lord is at hand. Now, I want you to notice this. Anxious is that word careful. Be, don't be anxious. For a backup verse, I'm going to go to Luke chapter 10 and 41. All of y'all remember this. Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And you'll take it away from her. Martha, what's Martha doing? Cooking for the Lord. What's she frustrated about? Because things is not going the way she thought it's going to go. Jesus didn't seem to have been concerned. I suppose if he smelt the cookies getting a little bit too burnt, he probably wouldn't have said a word. That wasn't his point. That wasn't his life. Now, let's analyze this thing. The verse we're going to use, I cannot be anxious. I cannot be careful. I can't be worried about this thing. Now, what am I going to do? Be careful for nothing. But in everything, do you think that's just written? In everything by prayer. What's the next thing you hit it with? And supplication. And what's the next thing you hit it with? And thanksgiving. After you have made prayer and supplication and intercession, I mean thanksgiving, what did you just do? <clears throat> Lord, I'm praying that you deliver me from this circumstances. Lord, thank you for delivering me from this circumstances. Lord, praise your holy name for delivering me from this circumstances. Once you do that, then let your request be made. Now, Lord, what I want you to do for me. If you start taking that formula, for an example, right there, and you begin to say, you know, really. <clears throat> I don't have to pray like I used to pray. Oh, God, if you don't give me this. <laughs> what about starting different? Pray, and then start thanking him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Then let your request be made known to God. Pray about what? I thought that's what we were praying about. I think we ought to change your prayer. We ought to just pray, Lord. Would you minister to the people that's hungry and starving tonight? I'm asking you to just minister to them. Lord, I just want to thank you and praise you for giving food to those hungry people, praying for other people, and then start saying, thank you, Lord. I just praise you, Lord. Now we'll make our request. <clears throat> but you see what happens when we start thinking. Nothing going right, and we get all worked up. We get our eyes focused on our problem. That's what happened to Mary and Martha. Martha had her attention on the burning beans, or whatever they're having. Mary had her attention on what Jesus is saying. I was invited to a home one Sunday for lunch. I'll tell you, that was the longest time I waited for a meal. I don't know. It seemed like they couldn't. I mean, if I opened my mouth and said anything, the cooks was in there. I wanted to go to the kitchen and do the talking. Let's eat. I mean, I'm hungry and going to have to go out to well. But the, you couldn't open your mouth and tell somebody to come in and check it out, you know. What did you say? <clears throat> You know, I have been at places already where, you know, I almost got afraid for church to let out because the amount of people is going to come after me. And they'll start asking you the craziest questions. They even want to know, 
whether they ought to buy a Chevy or a Ford. I suggest you ask Dave. <laughs> yeah, I tease him about that. <clears throat> but odd things. I mean, should I pay my rent first or should I pay this first? Man, I mean, you know, all kind of questions being asked. I believe sometimes the Lord is saying, Martha, Martha, why are you all worked up? Why are you so shook up tonight? Well, the psalmist had mind enough to ask that question and said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? What's going on here? I mean, really, can you identify what's wrong? Here we are. Listen, we don't have to have oppression, depression. You can overcome that stuff. The first day we see <clears throat> that we're not going to ponder on the past, all the bad things of the past. In fact, it's even good not to even remember some of the good you did. You remember when I gave $1,000 to that ministry? Oh, yeah. First thing you know, you're going to have the accusing finger of the accuser after you. And the second day we begin to, to, to arrest these thoughts that I wasn't brought up right. I didn't, I, mama didn't treat me right. And, and the reason I treat my children mean is because my mama and my daddy treated me mean. That's not the reason you do. The reason that you treat your children the way you do is because you made that choice. And number three, we're coming to the conclusion, I'm going to cast all my care on the Lord. It's no use me carrying this stuff around. <clears throat> How would you like to have a man come walking down the road carrying a whole bunch of stuff? You say, here, I'll take it. Oh, no, I'm too humble to let you carry any of this stuff. Some people say, would you pray for me that some of these burdens will be lifted? No, I'm not praying that kind of stuff. I used to, but I don't anymore. What's the idea of carrying any of them? He said, I'll take them all. Casting all your care on him. <clears throat> so we're, we get a picture now of ourselves. Oh, I don't have to carry this stuff. He's, he's carrying it for me. And I don't have to worry about my future need. Now, sometimes the Lord may correct us. And you say, all right, if you're going to depend on me for your future, then you're going to have to depend on me to give you wisdom to know how to operate. And then in the fifth one, the fifth day, we have made a final decision. We're not going to be a part of that gossiping, slandering crowd. That's an abomination to God. Start feeling better already, don't you? And then... Now, at sixth day, we're not going to be in the judging business. We're not going to condemn other people. But really, they ought to be condemned. No, you leave that up to the Lord. <clears throat> then day seven, we're just not going to worry about anything. We're just not going to worry. If we got something we need to pray about, we'll pray about it. We're going to give thanks for it. We ought to be happy people. You can't give thanks if you're all worried and struggling and falling around about it. Why don't you just let the Lord take care of it? This is the method of getting you out of that depression. You can get out of that depression. I don't have depression. I'm not about to start it. What do I want with the dumb stuff? When I can give the Lord the load to Gary, <clears throat> you know what? That's the good part. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Yeah. If you need to, write it down on a piece of paper, carry it with you. And when you, get, when you get to that and really spend a lot of time saying, I'm casting everything on the Lord, you may have to repent of some of the actions you've had in the past. And ask the Lord to forgive you of them. This is going to be a soul-searching one. And I'll warn you that in advance. This is going to be a soul-searching one. You may say, well, let me see. Now, I need to correct this and maybe that. That's what these formulas are for, to make us change. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And what a joy it is. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just excited about going through all these seven formulas and getting them all in your spirit. And uh, let me remind you before I close here. 
Don't let the accuser have the advantage of pointing his finger at you. Don't let him do it. <clears throat> You've been listening to the Truth, Light, and Life Ministries uh, subject on overcoming depression. If you'd like to write to us, you can write to us at Truth, Light, and Life Ministries International, Post Office Box 70, Mount Crawford, Virginia, 22841. God bless you and thanks for listening.